Wow, what a morning, right? Isn't technology a wonderful thing? Um, so, uh, first, before I start, two things. Um, it's awesome to be back, um, and a big round of applause for the SECTI organizers. They throw a wonderful conference. Uh, I, it really is probably one of Europe's premier conferences, so well done, guys. You, you really do a great effort. So this is going to be fun, because I'm going to spend half my talk doing this, because I've got no notes or no PDF in front of me, right? So uh, I'm seeing the same thing as you. So who was, um, who was here last year? Put your hands up. Okay. Do you, you might remember that I did a kind of like a history-based talk. Um, and I'm doing another history-based talk. It's not because I'm a historian. It's just I kind of like history. Um, and normally, it's kind of like a good way to talk about tech problems, because by taking computers out of it, we look at a problem for its actual fact rather than everything that influences it. So I'm going to talk about state surveillance. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about Snowden or Manning or the whole thing that we've been talking about for four or five years now. I'm going to talk about state surveillance during the European Reformation, which is about 500 years ago. People find it hard to believe that the, uh, the state has been spying on people for a long time. The truth of this talk is, is it's really about trying to get our head around the narrative that state surveillance is not a technical problem. It's a cultural problem. It's a historical problem. So, yes, is state surveillance a technical problem? Well, if you, if, if you ask Google, You'd, you'd think it would be, right? First recorded event of state surveillance history, NSA. Yeah, no Google, thanks. Um, I can assure you that the NSA were not the first to be doing state surveillance. But really, it's because spy spy, right? Um, it's a long history of this, right? Um, Sanzu, yeah, Sanzu, I'm not going to quote him, but drink him if you've got them, right? Um, Sanzu, well-documented history for spying. Uh, Alexander the Great, probably one of the greatest spy masters of his time. Genghis Khan, great spy master too. The Vatican, oh yeah, they were pretty good at this spying thing too. Um, they were also probably the second best in crypto analysis in the 15th century as well, 15th and 16th century. Interesting side story. Uh, Spain was not so good at crypto analysis. It was not so good at cryptography. They were using mon monolithic um, libraries, which meant that they were very susceptible to frequency analysis. Um, although they didn't believe it, so they petitioned the Pope to say that the, the French cryptographers um, were obviously in league with the devil. Um, and that's why they were able to break the ciphers. Luckily enough, the Vatican had been breaking the Spain's uh, ciphers too. So they knew it was nothing to do with the devil. Um, so that cryptographer got off on a good one because the Vatican was spying on Spain too. Um, the, in the 15th century, this became a little bit of a joke and Spain stepped up its game, right? But this is not what I'm talking about today, right? Um, I'm going to talk about some British history. Um, being a Scot, it's very close to my heart. It's actually next door, right? Um, so I'm going to talk about Henry Tudor, Henry VII. So what we find in uh, this period of time is that Britain has uh, a civil war that goes on um, that pretty much annihilates um, our normal way of life. We have this civil war that goes on far longer than it should have done, and it's a lot to do with succession when it boils down to it, moving the crown from one person to another person. Previous to Henry Tudor, uh, Henry VII, not Henry VIII, um, Britain really, really sucked at doing this. And every time a new monarch came along, uh, a new set of rules came along, and everyone got killed. Um, it, sometimes art mimics life, right? Um, if you want to like, look at crazy stuff, the Tudors are a great period. But Henry Tudor is, um, is a Lancastrian. Um, and he has a battle. This is the last English king to be killed in battle is Richard III. Um, and it's the Battle of Bosworth Field uh, where Richard III dies. Interestingly enough, they've only just recently discovered Richard III's body in a car park in Leicester. Um, 
Henry Tudor was crowned on the field of Bosworth Field. And Henry Tudor becomes a very different type of monarch within Britain and a pivotal change in how we do things happen. So, if you're wondering, this is Henry Tudor, this is Richard III, right? So two things that Henry Tudor did when he came into power is very, very interesting. So if we remember here, right, the Battle of Bosworth Field, when he came into power, if you look at the uh, records from the time, Henry Tudor put his succession to the English throne at the 21st of August, right, not the 22nd. And why he did this was, is this enabled him, um, he had half of his lords, his peers, were on Richard III's side, and the other half were on his side. And by writing in the history books that, the, that he became king on the 21st, anyone that took the field with Richard III was technically guilty of treason. Um, it's really true what Churchill said, you know, history will record well of me because I intend to write it. Um, I think he kind of borrowed that from Henry, right? Um, so this is the first thing that he did. The other thing he did is what we would deem today the special relationship, right? A dynastic marriage. Um, it's really a rebranding exercise. So anyone that knows anything about British history will know that the War of the Roses, Tudors and Lancastrians fought each other for the throne of England for far too long. When, when Henry Tudor came to power, what he did is he married Elizabeth York, uh, his, his opposite. Um, and basically, the Tudor Rose, which is this, is literally a merging of the two houses. It's literally a rebranding of the British monarchy. And this is to allow everyone in the British realm to understand, we're all on the same side now. If only it was so simple, right? The other thing that he did is money is a propaganda tool, right? Um, now, yes, monarchs have been putting their faces on coins for a while, but what Henry Tudor was doing was putting his whole body here on the coin. And this was given to foreign diplomats coming into the country and the British public to show them this is your king. And the problem is, is when you sort of usurp power, what you become is very worried that what you did to someone will be done to you. And if you're in governance, you push that, uh, um, we have this saying, shit rolls downhill, right? Um, and if you're paranoid, this is exactly what the British public get in return for it. So it looks kind of archaic, but we, um, we still do it, right? So this is Elizabeth II. The, the These are Commonwealth coins, because we need our Commonwealth to know who their queen is, right? This is Elizabeth II. Um, she's a lot cooler than Elizabeth I, if I'm honest. We'll talk about that in a little while, right? He also did this wonderful thing. Um, it's kind of like the alpha version of wage slavery. So, <clears throat> Richard III, uh, Henry VII has a real problem that half of, his, half of his empire hates him, right? Doesn't think that he's a king, thinks that he's a usurper, and he's likely to cause him problems. So what he does is he, he gets this Edmund Dudley fellow who had been quite famous in the finance. Believe it or not, they had a finance industry in the 1400s. Edmund Dudley was... Um, he, w he was given a position called uh, the head of the Council of Learned Law, and it reported only to Henry Tudor, didn't report to anyone else, and its sole purpose was to look for legal problems with the earls and lords that Henry VII uh, told the Council of Learned Law to investigate. They would find the minutest of problems and find the Lord guilty of those crimes. They would then find them an astronomical amount of money, in some cases the equivalent of 10 million euros today, right? And then they would say, but don't worry, we're going to suspend the sentence. But if you upset the king, we're calling that debt in. And literally, what he did is he built the debt into the laws to keep them in line. 
And if you were bad, you would get this, you know, this 10,000 pound fine, equivalent of like maybe 10 million euros today. Everything would be over for you, you, your family, the lot. Um, it's a wonderful term, right? Uh, Edmund Dudley called this extraordinary justice. Um, it sounds very American, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, very interesting, right? Kind of weighed sla slavery in reverse. Um, and then Henry VII dies, right? The problem with this is, is Henry VII dies. This is a European leader, right? It, the European continent is a thing. It is got diplomats and courts and royal courts and so on and so forth. The head of state for England dies and nobody knows for two days, right? And what happens is they keep Henry VII's death a secret, and they clear shop. So remember this chap, um, when Henry VII dies, they kill him, everyone related to him, and burn all the records of all the fines. Everyone gets a blank slate, right? Um, and we get Henry VIII, who um, influences Britain massively, uh, not just Britain, uh, but the native English-speaking world, and, and some beyond this, right? Uh, Henry Tudor, uh, Henry VIII was quite a young king, um, and he was governed by a guy called Sir Thomas More. Uh, Sir Thomas More was kind of like um, his teacher through childhood, um, but he's also, he was, while, uh, while Henry VIII was coming of age, he was basically the governor. Um, if you're worried, I've noticed some people are a little bit worried about Mother Teresa being made a saint, right? If you're worried about Mother Teresa being a saint, you should really be worried about this guy becoming a saint, right? Because he, took, he burnt 300 Protestants, right? Um, and he got made a saint, no problems at all. So um, it's all historical, right? This is Henry that you remember, right? This is the one that we all see. Um, but Henry's influence on Britain and going out with it, it, is massive. So the very idea of British governance is related to a Tudor, uh, a Tudor decision. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the divorce of, of England from the Roman Catholic Church and the implications that this co uh, caused. Um, but when this happened, um, basically what Henry did was he gave more power to the House of Lords so that they could um, separate from the Roman Catholic Church. He couldn't just get up one morning and say, yo, everyone, we're leaving the church, right? We're having our own church. It's all good. That's just not going to happen, right? He's, he's the quickest way to death for him was this way. So what he did is he gave more legal power to a government. Uh, and he said to the government, uh, the people want to leave the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. So you are here to do the will of the people. I said, well, how do you know? Well, I am the people, and I want us to leave the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> but this very notion starts the, what we have now as the, the, the British uh, government. This is the House of Lords. Another interesting side fact. If you ever look at, at Westminster, the British government, you'll see that the chairs are green, right? You, don't very, you very rarely see this red setup. The green one is the House of Commons. It's the only place in, uh, in England where the Queen is not allowed in. Um, she's prohibited from the House of Lords, which is why whenever they open up Parliament, this guy with a big stick walks along, knocks on the door, and tells everyone to follow him. Um, and this is why, because she's not allowed in there. But the very notion of how we govern uh, in Britain is related to Henry Tudor. Um, you're going to love this. I'm going to tell you where the, the term eavesdropper is nothing to do with technology. Sorry to burst your bubble, right? Henry Tudor, in his court, had faces carved into the eaves of his court, right? And this is to tell the members of the court, like the British legal system, basically, the central government, that you're always being watched, you're always being listened to, everything you say here, we know. This is 500 years ago. This is basically the equivalent of CCTV. 
Britain has 11 CCTV uh, uh, one CCTV camera for 11 citizens. It's only because we've had 500 years to get ahead around that the government wants to watch us. Um, remarkable. But yeah, um, I find that quite interesting. The other interesting thing with Henry VIII is he adopts a title called the Defender of the Faith. And a lot of Brits think this is in relation to him being the head of the Church of England. And it's actually not. It's the title Defender of the Faith that was bestowed upon him from Pope Louis, uh, Leo X. Um, and this is predominantly given to him for the rebuttal um, of Martin Luther. Um, and this is a really interesting period in British history. And it's a really interesting period in history, period, right? So Henry, the Tudor, Henry Tudor writes um, a counter-argument to, um, to Martin Luther. But what really makes this difference is, is, is tech, as people involved in technology, we tend to look at the internet as this um, world-changing, revolutionary thing, right? It's changed us. And really, it's no more of a paradigm shift than the printed press, right? Because what suddenly happens is, is you're able to print propaganda and reproduce it 3,000 times and put it into general circulation. Um, previous to the printed press, this, you'd have 3,000 people writing it out, right? Um, this suddenly changes the game. But for this, he becomes defender of the faith, right? Um, it's a title that every British monarch has had since then. Um, Defender of the Faith is a, is a Henry Tudor uh, invention. So, yeah, the printed press. The other interesting thing is probably the most famous uh, Tudor uh, influence on, on Britain is the divorce from the Roman Catholic Church. And this is all to do with... The, the great Tudor problem of the, the male heir, right? So this is Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon is Henry Tudor's first wife. Um, the wife that he's married to the longest, 17 years they were married. All other wives put together did not last that long, um, including Anne Boleyn. So... Uh, also, Anne Boleyn is the only British queen to be executed as well, right? Uh, English queen, to be technical about it. So, basically, what happens is Catherine of Aragon, uh, who is the cousin to uh, the Emperor of, of Spain, right? Um, they have children, but they're only daughters. Um, and they have sons, but they don't come to term. Um, there's a lot of problems. And eventually, Henry decides it's because the marriage is cursed and he seeks an annulment. And the grounds that he makes on it is, is that Catherine of Aragon was originally married to um, Arthur Tudor. Arthur Tudor uh, is Henry's brother um, and was supposed to be the king of England. Died around 17. Um, so Henry Tudor was this playboy Right? He was never supposed to be king, just supposed to go off and be a European prince and you know, have, do stuff that European princes are supposed to do. Arthur Tudor dies, and then all of a sudden, Henry, playboy prince, becomes playboy king. Um, but what he says is, ah, oh, after 17 years, the marriage is not genuine because like, I married my, my brother's wife, and um, that's why we can't have male heirs. That, that, that's why that's happening. And Catherine of Aragon argued for a long time, uh, no, no, we never consummated the marriage when I was married to Arthur. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I don't believe that for one moment. But this one instance um, causes a shift in continental Europe that still ripples today. Um, so we all think that divorce is something that doesn't happen um, in the Catholic world, right? in this period. This is not true. European princes were getting divorced from the Pope for ages, for a long, long time. It was a standard, it was a standard sort of thing, nothing complicated. So Henry Tudor, Henry VIII, petitions for a divorce. The problem is, is that Catherine of Aragon, um, well, she's Spanish, right? And her, 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 I think his nephew, is now the King of Spain. 
Um, and the Pope doesn't really want to piss off Spain at this moment, so he says, no. Henry Tudor is this playboy European prince turned king who has never heard the word no in his life um, and loses his shit about it, basically. And he asks this guy, Cardinal Wolsey, um, to petition, to fix the problem. And Cardinal Wolsey is basically British prime minister. And this is really the epitaph in Britain, but that we like to think there's a separation between the church and the state. And this is actually the proof of the opposite. Um, if you're ever looking for a guy, a working class guy that did well, sort of his story, if you ignore the end. Um, so, son of a butcher, rises up, becomes prime minister, makes a lot of money, um, looks, he's the second most powerfulest man in the whole of Henry's empire, which is still pretty big for that time. Um, and during the time, he builds Hampton Court. Hampton Court is a palace um, in any other name that is, competes with any other European palace. It's not a palace at the time because there's no kings and queens there. Um, when, uh, I don't think the H was originally there or the person in the pink T-shirt, but be forgiven. This is the central governance. This is where we get the beginning of British central governance. The whole of uh, Henry's empire ends up being run. Remember that eavesdropper picture that I showed you earlier on? They're there. Um, and when um, Wolsey's fall from grace happens, he has to gift Henry Tudor uh, Hampton Court, becomes Hampton Court Palace. Um, if you ever get a chance, please go and visit, take a photograph of those eavesdropper and tweet me, right? I've never seen them personally. However, no matter how good Cardinal Wolsey is, he cannot get the Pope to give Henry Tudor a divorce. And he ends up basically losing his job for it. Um, and he has Anne Boleyn in Henry Tudor's ear. In British politics, we've always had this problem that those that have the ear of the leaders have control of the, of the country. This is a problem that we've always had. Um, this is the same case. So basically what happens in Wolsey's life is he does really good for 17 years, makes a lot of money, makes Henry very happy, reverses the debt, makes Britain a prosperous country, but he can't get a divorce from the Pope. So he gets fired. And then Anne Boleyn keeps on telling Henry Tudor, ah, oh, Wolsey's a traitor, Wolsey's a traitor, Wolsey's a traitor. And eventually Henry snaps. And then she, he summons uh, Wolsey to... Uh, to court for investigation for uh, treason. And uh, en route, he dies of natural causes. Um, now, he may well have died of natural causes. I was never there, so I can't tell you. Um, and I would imagine, if you're in your late 60s, being dragged to London to meet a guy that really likes cutting people's heads off, um, you might have a little bit of stress and you might possibly die of a heart attack. Or you might think, fuck that and take your own life, which is not so cool if you're a Roman Catholic, right? Um, but he died of natural causes. But who fixes the problem is a guy called Thomas Cromwell. Um, and Thomas Cromwell is a, a, a reformist. Um, very interesting fellow. Um, he is related to Oliver Cromwell. Um, and if you know your British history, this will totally tell you that... Um, if you don't pluck a root out of the problem, it might very well come back and cut your head off a couple of hundred years later. But that being said, Thomas Cromwell works out a solution. They divorce England from the Roman Catholic Church. So Thomas Cromwell is a reformist, and so is Anne Boleyn. And Anne Boleyn um, says to, to Henry Tudor, oh, look, um, you're, uh, read this Machiavelli book about European princes, right? Um, no one has right to governance of you, not even the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is involved in basically law-giving to its countries. If you're convicted of a crime, it's priests that are convicting you, right? It's not judges. Um, so in comes Thomas Cromwell. And Thomas Cromwell makes the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer is the guy that makes the argument that, oh, look, we were never part of the Roman Catholic Church, really, right? 
Henry's always been the boss. He's never, had to, he's never answered to anyone. We just forgot. That's all that happened. So we've remembered now, and fuck this shit. It's done. And he annuls Catherine of Aragon's marriage, um, making Mary Tudor a bastard, uh, technically speaking. Uh, he'll pay a price for that later on. Um, and making Anne, uh, Anne Boleyn's marriage legal. Not a very popular person, but Archbishop of Canterbury, here he is. Um, big reformist as well. Interestingly enough, had a German wife as well. Um, and did this prior to the, to the Church of England becoming a thing. So he was a big naughty when he did it, right? Um, spent some time with Martin Luther. So 1534 happens, thanks to uh, Thomas Kramer. And the Church of England becomes a thing. So the Church of England really is a religion born out of divorce. So don't feel that these people can lecture people about who and what they should marry um, because their whole organization is built out of annulling someone's marriage because the king didn't want it. Um, okay. The act of supremacy happened. Surprisingly, the British public um, wasn't too keen on Anne Boleyn because they saw it for bullshit too, right? Um, so we got a thing called the act of supremacy, which is basically... Uh, the swearing of allegiance to the king and recognizing the king as the head of the church and recognizing the marriage of Anne Boleyn and recognizing um, that Catherine of, Arag uh, Catherine of Aragon is not a queen. Um, and everyone had to swear allegiance to this throughout the whole country. And if you didn't, you were executed for it. So do you remember that? Sir Thomas More, that I talked about earlier on, who was basically the mentor for Henry Tudor, who raised him as a child, taught him, he was a very, very Catholic person. And he was willing to swear allegiance to the king. He was willing to recognize Anne Boleyn, but he was not willing to accept that Henry Tudor was the head of the church. And Henry cut his head off uh, as a thanks for it, right? Um, yeah, Henry's really a guy that you don't say no to, even if, like, you were the guy that he taught, right? So, yeah, uh, Sir Thomas More. When he was executed, um, Sir Thomas More was then made a saint by the... the, the he, was, he, he became a martyr as far as the Roman Catholic Church became. Interestingly enough, Henry Tudor was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church not once, but twice. Um, in 35, they... They excommunicated him. And then in 38, they excommunicated him again. It's basically the Roman Catholic equivalent of fuck off, and when you get there, fuck off some more. Um, basically. I mean, I'm not too sure how you can excommunicate. So you're dead to us, but you're dead some more. Um, anyway. But this changes Britain because all of a sudden, uh, the Catholic Mass, which is a huge part of, of British culture at this point, becomes an act of heresy. What was normal suddenly changes. And the very thought of disrupting Mass um, is a cardinal sin. You're going to burn in hell. Oh, hang on a second. We're all part of the Church of England now. Fuck these guys. Um, no problems at all. This is a huge battle that the British psyche goes through because in working class British politics, the um, life was hard, right? Hard for any continental European for working class, right? Life was hard. The uh, daily struggle, the only sanctuary that you had is that when you would die, you would go to a better place, right? That, that was the deal. Uh, and then all of a sudden, game changed, right? Dude, how are you going to get the US into this? It has to be done. Right? If you look at Henry Tudor's influence, right, you wouldn't have a modern America that you see it today without Henry Tudor's influence in England. The very idea of U.S. governance is born from Westminster. But more importantly, British Protestants and German Protestants predominantly settle and colonize America. And the very uh, Americanization is uh, a, a Protestant effort. 
um, not all of it, and I know it's, uh, I know it's leaning, I know it's, I know it's a reach, but yeah, without Henry Tudor, we, we wouldn't have an America that we recognize today either. But I don't think you can blame Henry Tudor for the whole American thing either, right? Um, do you remember that awkward moment where um, England is the axis of evil and religious extremists? Um, yeah, this is that moment. Um, so there is a point in European history where England is the axis of evil, right? L literally. Don't go there. They are religious extremists. It sounds all a little bit familiar, right? Um, this, I, I love doing this talk in Germany because it's a recycle, reduce, reuse story, right? So when England left the Church of England, what it also did was dismantle all the monasteries, uh, nearly all the monasteries in connection for it. So wealth in, in continental Europe, but certainly in England, was judged by the land you owned, right? That's what wealth was. You could be rich, but wealthy was land. And um, land gave you political power. It gave you rights to vote. It gave you lots of different things that you couldn't get if you were just rich, wealthy. Um, so when England divorced from the, the Roman Catholic Church and they dismantled the monasteries, they had this um, land that was basically up for sale. So Thomas Cromwell looked at the whole situation, basically took all the gold, silver, and sold the land uh, from the monasteries and made new lords and new earls, the new men, as they were seen at the time. This sort of pissed off the Roman Catholic Church a little bit, because what do you mean you're dismantling our religious buildings? Yeah, fuck you guys, right? Um, and this is the equivalent here of a UN intervention. So the Pope manages to talk France, Spain, uh, uh, and a few others to invade England and bring it back in line with the church. Um, what Henry did was take all the materials from the dismantled monasteries, all those stones, and took them to the coast and built fortifications. So the irony here is, is that the very monasteries that launched the failed invasion of England um, are the very stones that defended England from that said invasion, right? Recycle, reduce, reuse, right? Um, you, you've got to love the irony here, right? Who would have thought Henry Tudor was a green, right? Although Thomas Cromwell paid a big price for this in the end, right? So Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell kind of fall apart, right? Um, what happens is, I mean, Thomas Cromwell is involved in why Anne Boleyn has her head cut off. He's inherently connected to it. And it's rumors, it's propaganda within the court, right? When Anne Boleyn had her head cut off, uh, it was for heresy, treason, and incest, right? Um, I, I'm not sure there's many other monarchs that have been beheaded for um, incest, but hey-ho, we've got a British prime minister that had to deny sleeping with dead pigs, so welcome to Britain. Um, so what happens is, is that the old uh, lords didn't like the new men because, hey, they're of low blood. They just brought their way into being high blood. We're not having that. So they start a propaganda campaign against Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell, in the end, uh, is found guilty of treason uh, and writes this kind of this famous letter to Henry Tudor the day before his execution. Um, and asked for his gracious prince to give him mercy, mercy, mercy. And uh, Henry's answer to this was, uh, we'll just cut his head off, we won't quarter him. Um, which is nice. Um, but, you know, I'm painting a bad picture of Henry. He was very regretful for the decision, because this is what he had to say about beheading his most faithful servant. Um, I'm sure Thomas Cromwell will be grateful to hear that on light pretext by false accusation it made me put to death the most, the most faithful servant I've ever had. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, moving on. But we can really talk about the most dangerous man in Tudor Britain. Um, and you probably have never heard of him. And this guy called William Tyndall. 
And Wendell, William Tyndall is the alpha whistleblower, right? Um, he's a bit like Julian Assange, but likable. Um, sorry if Julian's watching, but hey, he's never going to leave East London anyway, so ha <laughs> um, So William Tyndall translates the English, uh, translates the Bible from Latin to English. So consider this an IP theft, right? Consider the Bible written in Latin as digital rights management, because what it does is it stops the working class from being able to read the Bible. So what it enables is churches, bishops, so on and so forth, to be able to give control, to forgive, to punish, to tax, to sin, to give freedom, to give damnation, right? And William Tyndall is like, yo, I, I've read this stuff, and I don't see anything about popes and papacies and cathedrals or anything like this, right? Um, and I'm not having it. I'm going to go translate it, right? Martin Luther's done it. Erasmus has done it. We're going to do it. And he gets arrested for treat. He gets arrested for heresy, right? And this is really the story of the one that got away. So William Tyndall, in his trial, tells the Catholics, basically, if you let me go, I will write a Bible in English, and I will give, uh, I will give. The, the common working folk, the scripture. I will teach more scripture to the boy that drives the plow than you will ever do in your lifetime. And basically they go, oh, fair enough, fuck off then. Um, they obviously didn't believe him. The first thing he did is he realized that maybe it was not a good, good idea to be in England anymore. So he hops on a boat, and guess who he ends up living with? Martin Luther. Um, so you have these two hardcore Protestants uh, Martin Luther teaches William Tyndall German, uh, and he writes, the, uh, he writes William Tyndall's Bible um, in English, uh, the most deadliest book that you can ever imagine. Here is a copy of it. You can still buy these things, right? And there's not too many of them. A great piece of history. But this is the first mass-produced English Bible. And this is some interesting shit about to happen here. Uh, Bible operational security. So... This book is the most dangerous book you can own. If you are caught with this book, I'm going to kill you, your family. I'm taking everything from you. Not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to put you on a stake and burn you to show other people that if you have this book, I'm going to ruin your day. Um, so the book was specifically designed to be palm-sized. So it's easy to hide upon your person. This is an extreme contraband. It's basically like a kilo of smack, right? Um, you have to kite it on you. But this influence today is why we see palm Bibles. It's why they're these size. It's operational security. It's because of its illicit uh, nature. So this is Bible OPSEC, right? Um, and this is brought into again, yet again, by the revolution that we found of the printed press. Yes, people had translated the English Bible before. Um, However, it was monks, and they had to write it out by hand. So they like, a whole monastery would maybe produce a Bible, and then there'd be some trouble, right? However, in the Netherlands, uh, hey, the printed press thing was a big thing, and they were able to print this book in huge quantities, and then smuggle it back into Britain in lots of different ingenious ways, right? So they would put, it, um, they would put the loose leaves in other books and ship them across, and then on the receiving end, you would take it out and put it together, and you would have your illegal book. Um, it's like the anarchist cookbook, I suppose. Um, but the printed press allows this to happen. The Roman Catholic Church starts to lose its control over governance of the English native-speaking world, right? Because now you can have religion without the church. Um, what's interesting about the most illegal book in Tudor England is that this becomes 80% of the King James New Testament. Um, you won't find, uh, you won't find uh, uh, Tyndall's name anywhere, but 80% of the King James's Bible is actually William Tyndall's work. Um, and actually, translating the Bible was quite a, a difficult job. Um, I'll explain a little bit why. Uh, this is William Tyndall. Uh, this is Thomas Kramer, actually. 
Thomas Kramer, remember Mary Tudor? Remember that person that he annulled them, her mother's marriage and said that she was a bastard and she couldn't be, she couldn't be like the, the monarch of England? Fortunately, she became the monarch of England. Um, and when she found him, uh, she got her revenge. So um, we have this really strange period in British history where we kind of like have alpha, um, almost like an alpha version of McCarthyism, right? Of course, if we knew now, we wouldn't have called this McCarthyism. We would have called it Hooverism, but it's a totally different story, right? But we have a period in British history, uh, like maybe a 50-year period, where if you're a Roman Catholic, it's a bad day in the office. And all of a sudden, if you're a Protestant, it's a bad day in the office. And then all of a sudden, if you are a Catholic, it's a bad day in the office. We have this 50-year period where uh, your religion really influences if you will survive the end of the day or not. And that religion has a paradigm shift depending on who's leading the country on that day. Um, so what you have is this period of where you can accuse your neighbor of being a Catholic or a Protestant, and you're going to see them uh, you're going to see them being uh, tortured until they confess. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of people confessed. Um, but it's, McCarthyism, in its own right, is defined uh, by using the judiciary process as a form of, of, of punishment. Torture to get to the truth. Um, yeah, I think we could count that, right? This is, uh, this is Mary Tudor. You'd be forgiven to thinking this is Vigo from Ghostbusters. Um, she's very so she was never called Bloody Mary in her lifetime there was a reason for this right <laughs> she killed more people than the Spanish Inquisition in eight years she burnt over 300 Protestants uh, in, in, uh, in eight years um, was, was very much marked by her life um, of becoming Princess and lady. Princess and lady. Um, rather evil, actually. This is the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I. She's kind of cool, but fuck her, she's not my queen, right? She killed my queen, so... <laughs> right? So this is, this is Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the daughter of Anne Boleyn, right? Anne Boleyn, you remember the one that had her head cut off for incest? This is her daughter. Um, she becomes Queen of England at one point. This is a letter that, um, this is wonderful, right? This is a letter that when Mary Tudor became Queen Mary, um, this is a letter that Lady Elizabeth, who later becomes Queen Elizabeth, sends to Mary explaining that she doesn't want to be the queen, that she doesn't want to, she's not here to usurp her, but she loves her sister. But what she does, do you notice these lines? These are put in by Elizabeth. And the reason that they're put in by Elizabeth is so that they can't have forgeries added to the bottom of the letter. This is a defense against uh, injection attacks, what it boils down to. Oh, you laugh, it's exactly what it is. Um, Mary Stewart doesn't learn this lesson and ends up lo losing her head for it, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so yeah, uh, forgeries uh, are a big problem here too, right? This is Mary Stewart. Mary, so I'm a Scot, right? Um, I'm from the McKinnon clan. Uh, we're Stuart, we, we were Stuart supporters. I lost my ancestral homes for supporting the Stuarts. Not me personally. I was a bit busy on that day. I hadn't been born yet. Um, but Mary Stuart is Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, she's also the Queen of France for a little while too. Um, so she is, there's a lot of people that think She's not to be on the English crown. She's a Protestant. Uh, her marriage is um, her mother's marriage was annulled. She's not. Uh, she's not. Of, she's not right. Right. She's a usurper. And half of the Catholic British public really want Mary Queen of Scots. So there's this 18-year period um, where um, this is this is the conspiracy. This is Elizabeth who everyone is trying to kill. The Roman Catholic Church had already ordained her assassination uh, multiple times uh, of Elizabeth I. So Mary, when her husband dies, she has to come back to Scotland. 
Um, and Scotland is a hugely Protestant country at this point, and Mary is a hugely Catholic queen at this point. And the Scottish nobles basically don't like her. Um, really, they just can't work with her. And she marries, uh, she marries her cousin, because this is what monarchs do, right? Um, and it doesn't work out. Basically, he's a heavy-handed bastard that hits her a lot and is desperate to have power. He's a regent, not a king. He doesn't like this. So, surprisingly, his house blows up, and he goes flying out the window. Um, but he survives the explosion, only to be strangled. Um, it's a bad day, right? Bad luck comes in threes, right? <laughs> so, she gets blamed for it. It's kind of likely it probably was. I'm not sure she did the strangling bit, and I'm not sure she blew the house up, but I'm pretty sure she knew what was going on. Um, and basically, she gets exiled, uh, and her son becomes James VI of England, uh, James VI of Scotland. Um, and Mary Tudor is left with a position where she has to run to England and ask for sanctuary of her cousin, Elizabeth I, who... Mary Stuart is basically the next in line if Elizabeth doesn't have uh, uh, an heir. So all of a sudden, she makes her life so much more dangerous that she basically imprisons her for 17 years. Um, and this guy, Walsingham. Walsingham is the godfather of the British intelligence service. Okay, um, He was minister of security. The only reason that we had Elizabeth for as long as we did is this guy. But this guy is a ruthless, ruthless man. Um, when he died, it turned out that he had 54 embedded spies in different courts throughout Europe. Um, he had a plethora of crypto analysis teams. All of his secretaries were trained in code breaking. Um, this guy was really at the forefront of... Uh, of of secure communications. It's interesting because secure communications in, uh, in, in continental politics is something that comes about after the, the Renaissance, bringing in from the, 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 the Arab mathematicians, right? So they spend the first half of the 15th century developing secure communications. And then they spend, well, up until today, trying to break them. Um, so there you go, this guy was involved in this. Mary, Tudor, Mary Stuart ends up being executed for a thing called the Babington Plot. This is Arthur Babington. Um, he's a Catholic. And basically what he's trying to do is um, kill Elizabeth and have uh, Mary put on. However, what they didn't realize is this guy had a double agent working with this guy. Um, so all the communications, all the encrypted ciphers between Babington and uh, Mary Queen of Scots were being passed off to crypto analysis teams um, because of a guy called Gilbert Gifford, uh, who was a double agent. Uh, did I remind you that this is like 500 years ago, right? Not the plot to a Bond movie, uh, actual real life. Um, this is an example. So when Mary Stuart was executed, they destroyed everything to do with Mary Stuart because they didn't, she died considered a martyr. So the block that they cut her head off was burnt, her clothes were burnt, all of her letters were burnt. But this is a, a, one of the ciphers from Babington to uh, Elizabeth, uh, to Mary Stuart. Um, uh, very interesting. If you've got some time, there's a, there's a, uh, th there's a number of books and, and so on and so forth that you can read about Elizabethan ciphering. It's very, very interesting. Um, yeah, so this is my queen, uh, the statue to her. Uh, and this is her being executed. Although this is a rendition of it, this is not kind of how Mary Stuart was executed. She was found guilty of uh, treason, which is quite interesting because she's not, she's not English. Uh, she has no allegiance to the English throne. Um, she's a Scottish regent, which Scotland is an independent country at this point, right? So Elizabeth is quite clear that it's a little bit worrying that um, we can't really kill queens because that sets a dangerous precedent. And if we kill that queen, someone might think about killing me, and that's really not a good idea. Um, Walsingham, on the other hand, thought, fuck that, got the order signed and took her head off. Um, 
she tried her best to be very gracious in it, and she did very well. She came out in martyr's colors. She forgave the executioner before he executed her. Um, she, made, uh, she made a promise about, you know, seeing you all in the afterlife, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then it took three attempts to take her head off. Um, it was quite brutal. And then, as was done at this time, the executioner goes to pick the head up to show it to the crowd. And, of course, at this time, Mary Stewart was a little bit older. Um, so she was wearing a wig. So they pick up the head, and the head just phew, drops straight off. It was a complete clusterfuck. Um, yeah, and we've never kind of forgiven them, the English, for this afterwards, right? Um, it is a rough wooing, right? This is really the roughest type of wooing at this point. Um, so draw some parallels, because I'm running out of time, okay? Uh, Tyndall's influence. Tyndall later gets caught. Um, he doesn't get caught. They've tried to assassinate Tyndall throughout Europe for ages. There's agents for a good 30, 40 years trying to kill this guy, right? Gets away with it. And then eventually, he is, uh, he's grasped up by another priest, right? Tr you know, he's sold to the, to the English from another priest. It's a fucking sorry state of affairs when you can't trust the papacy, right? Um, but they execute him for, for his sins. And remember, 20 years later, they use all his work again. Um, but Tyndall's, William Tyndall's influence on the native English-speaking world alone, there's only other one William that has had such an influence, and that's Shakespeare. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Uh, the Bible um, doesn't naturally lend itself to being translated uh, to English. So Tyndall fills in the blanks. He's a really good wordsmith. And those terms and phrases, the English... I mean, this is the definement of the Bible in some ways, right? Um, and this is a Tyndall invention. You know, they tried to kill him, but at the end of the day, um, the attendance to the Roman Catholic Church has been declining constantly. So it just goes to show you can't really arrest an idea, right? Um, now the church has no control over, over religion itself. Historically, I've only taught some. I've only taught some. Uh, I talked about some of the small, interesting facts throughout this period. Right? It's a rather, really interesting period. Uh, but historically, Europeans have been spied on. Right? I mean, you have you have to look at the fact that if you need cryptography in 1500s, it's because people are reading your shit. Right? That that's what it boils down to. Wolsey, um, remember the the the. the the guy who built Hampton Court Palace yonder slide deck ago, right? Um, his spies were so good that they could intercept Spanish communications before they left the palace, um, or en route, so that they could intercept the from the Spanish ambassador to the Spanish courier, to the Spanish boat, to the Spanish captain, to Spain. And along that, that supply chain, Wolsey not only could intercept, but copy um, the letters, and seal them back again so that the, uh, the Spaniards could not tell what had happened. But historically, Europeans have been spied on by our states. We've been doing it for a very, very long time. And the reality of that is, is that I'm not too sure why. The governments of our, our, our continent uh, have a real problem with you having an idea that they don't know about. Uh, it seems to be a real problem throughout the time. It's not a technical problem. You could blame America for as much as you want about state surveillance, but they weren't even here when this stuff was going on, right? 200 years later. There is a small irony that um, Britain helps America subvert the uh, Fourth Amendment, right? Uh, the Fourth Amendment was there to stop Britain from warrantly investigating Americans, and then they use us to get around needing the Fourth Amendment, right? Um, but you can't blame this. I mean, uh, the cradle of, of spying is a very old one. We've given birth to a lot of nations with this. Now, state surveillance is definitely older than any state that denies its involvement in state surveillance, right? I can assure you this. I'm going to leave you... Uh, I know a lot of you think this is maybe the elephant in the room, but I'm going to leave you with uh, this one quote. Okay. A clear and innocent conscience fears nothing. Sounds an awful lot like uh, if, you have nothing to f if you've got nothing to fear, you've got nothing to hide. We've been saying this shit for 500 years. I think maybe it's time to stop. Um, and with that, I'm done.
So uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Phoenix. Um, apologize for the technical screw-ups in the beginning. Uh, we should always have things tested before we go on stage, I guess. But that was very enlightening. So to keep on track with time, we don't have much oh, time cool. for question. But I was kind of wondering, uh, was, what do you find the most surprising when you were researching this? What fat was the most like, oh shit? Um, uh, th there's nothing new under the sun, right? It's, it, it's really easy for us to look at um, things as like, wow, I can't believe they're doing this now. And you think, well, actually, they've been doing it for so long. Um, it's the depth of how far it goes back. I mean, uh, the fact that they're code breaking, uh, mm -hmm. quite advanced ciphers in 1530, um, as though it's nothing. Is, I find it amazing in some ways. Do we have any questions from the audience for this? One over here, Clonic. Hang on, just got a microphone. Wait, yeah, wait for a microphone. It's only one comment more than one question. I'm Spanish, and you know, the Spanish Inquisition didn't kill shit compared to the English Inquisition. Yes, uh, but the Spanish Inquisition is incredibly well known for killing Protestants. Um, it's the, the de facto thing that most people in modern day know. Um, and what I was saying is, is that Mary Tudor was far more dangerous than the Spanish Inquisition ever was. And yet we don't talk about her in the same context as we talk about, uh, as we talk about the Spanish Inquisition. It seems unfair to me um, that we blame the Spanish Inquisition in one way, but we don't give, uh, we, we allow Mary Tudor a blank pass, right? It seems like bullshit in some ways. So yeah, you're right. The Spanish Inquisition was a lot less deadly. Any more for any more? Well, that, uh, Go and enjoy some coffee and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. So we have, thank you.